Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part five of Peace and Safety. In the previous study, uh, well, in this part three, the people didn't want the Lord as king. And then in part four, those that were supposed to be the shepherds, the pastors, the ministers, the priests, whatever you want to call them, well, they were doing things out of their own heart, in their own mind. They were saying things that the Lord didn't send them to say or tell them to say. Doesn't sound like any different today, does it? You know, it really kills me when um, people will believe anything that a rabbi, well, a self-proclaimed rabbi tells them, or somebody on the television. I mean, really, TBN and 700 Prophets of Baal Club, you know, they get uh, hundreds of thousands of people watching them. It kills me. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But, you know, Jesus said, fear not little flock. When he had the multitudes following him, quite a few of them were following him because the bread and the fish. That's why they were following him. Not because they valued his words. It's because he was feeding them. So, let's go take a look at... We're going to do the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to do... Oh, I suppose Ezekiel 37. Let me take a look. Now, I thought I did this, but maybe I just read it recently and I'm thinking I did this, but if I did it, bear with me, please. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophecy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Now, the word breath, whether you read it in the Hebrew or in the Greek, it could be uh, breath, breath of the Lord, Sometimes it's wind. Other times it's the word spirit. For example, well, let's take a look at Genesis. Now in, uh, let's see, Revelate, I'm sorry, Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So first, the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground, you know, gave him a body, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, what's interesting is in the Greek, the word for uh, wind, breath, and spirit is the word pneuma, which is where we get the word for uh, pneumatic tools, air tools, pneuma. Has a very, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew meanings are not that far off, really. For example, uh, the word nation in the Greek is from the word ethnos, where we get the word ethnic group. You know, Caucasians are an ethnic group. So, let's go back to Ezekiel. Uh, 37 and verse 8. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews in the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them, and but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. See, there is that wind. Wind, breath, spirit, right? Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Remember in um, what happened in the day of Pentecost? Well, let's skip to Acts chapter 2. Now, you got to realize this um, Ezekiel is looking, I mean, it, it might have happened in his day, but. Um, I feel it's kind of like a, a shadow towards the future. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Didn't know they had Hondas back in them days, huh? Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There's that pneuma. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And let me tell you, people, when these, when these people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were on fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, same thing. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when they were speaking tongues, they were speaking to them in their own languages. They weren't slithering on the floor, speaking gibberish that nobody could understand. You know, I I have such little respect for uh, some of the doctrines of the Pentecostals. I mean, you know, I've had them say, well, if you don't speak with tongues, you're not saved. That's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, okay, where's that in the Bible? And they can't show you. Of course, they'll try to tell you that that's what this is. But uh, all right, so let's read verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language, not gibberish. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue or language, wherein we were born? Parthians. Parthians. You know, um, 
there was an empire called Parthia. They were contemporaries with the Roman Empire. And guess what? I, from what I understand, they were uh, partly Israel, as far as I can tell. Have you ever heard of the Parthian Empire? I hadn't. I mean, I've been a student of history for many, many years, and I never heard of the Parthian Empire until just recently. They have hidden our history. The children of the devil. I mean, Parthia uh, was the empire in the area of uh, what is now Persia or Iran. Persia and Parthia. Um, let me give you a little bit of history background, and we'll go back to the Bible study. All right, so the Assyrian Empire rose up and took northern Israel captive and part of Judah. And then they collapsed when the Babylonians arose, and the Babylonians came and took Judah and Jerusalem captive. Okay? And then they collapsed because of the Persians. Now, oh, I should say the um, the Medes and the Chaldeans were part of the ba uh, Babylonian Empire. I'm sorry, no, the, the, ba uh, the Chaldeans. The Persians and the Medes were, pa pa they were the ones that released Judah in the days of Daniel and let them go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. That was the Medes and the Persians. And uh, Cyrus and Dar Dar Darius or Darius, I've heard it's both ways, you know, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, the, the, tomato, tomato, I don't know. But um, I wonder if the Parthians and the Persians were the same people. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, they have hidden our history so much, it's hard to tell. But uh, the Romans lost some major battles with the Parthians. And according to one historian that I was reading, uh, the wise men that came to uh, greet Christ in the manger, they were from Parthia. And they weren't just three wise men. They had an entire entourage, probably with armed soldiers. And Rome said that uh, gave them uh, freedom to go worship at Jerusalem as they saw fit because they didn't want to have wars with Parthia because they got their uh, rear ends whipped a few times if you catch my drift. Uh, there were times Rome beat them and then there was times the Parthians beat them. And of course they were aligned with the uh, Scythians, Scythians. But, uh, and uh, perhaps you've heard of the, uh, when the Greeks uh, what was it, the uh, King Leonidas, the 300 or the 600 or whatever it was. I think it was the 300. Uh, the, uh, you had the Athenians, the, uh, those of Athens, and then you had the Spartans. And they were both Greeks, but just different city-states. So you had, uh, let's see, you had the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, which I kind of think that the, it was Parthia, too, in, their, in that mix somewhere. Then, after Persia, Greece rose up, Alexander the Great. And then after that came, came Rome. And then after that, you know, you had various different empires. But the, but the point was, I think it was in part two, that Israel didn't want the Lord as king. They wanted their own king. And when their kings were so wicked, the Lord let other kingdoms come in and punish them. So, I mean, that's basic. That is exactly what happened. Uh, Assyria came to punish Israel, and then 
Babylon came to punish Judah. And uh, I think Parthia was part of Israel. I think Greece was part of Israel. But then after Greece had conquered the area of Israel, then Rome came. And I just I despise these Hebrew roots people that, you know, they're trying to tell you, oh, well, the New Testament was not written in Greek, and his name was not Jesus. You know, they don't realize. Alexander the Great conquered from basically part of Afghanistan, part of India, all through the Middle East, all the way down to Egypt, conquered that whole area. He, from what I understand, he never lost a battle. Not one battle did he ever lose. But he died when he was in his mid-30s or so, or early 30s. I think he died around 33, 34, somewhere around there. I guess his heart was lifted up and the Lord let him die. But uh, they conquered that whole area. So when Christ was born, Greek was a common language. You know, it was a very common language. So, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the Judahites had been sold into slavery in Greece. And you never know where Israel went. After the Assyrian Empire collapsed, uh, Israel took off in every direction to, to get away. So maybe they went to Parthia. Maybe they went to uh, they went to the Caucasus Mountains. Ended up going to Europe because they got tired of the constant fighting in the Middle East. I you know they they were scattered all over. That's what God prophesied. So all right, but let's go back to Acts chapter two. So verse eight, and how hear we every man in our own tongue or language, wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? You know, what's the meaning of this? Well, Israel lived in all these different areas. And if you're going to live in an area, you should learn a language. But uh, that doesn't apply to these third world aliens that are coming to our country. I remember when Miami actually spoke English. It doesn't speak English anymore. I mean... You know, it's been invaded, you know. I mean, I've got respect for the, the um, especially the first early waves of Cubans. I got respect for them. I mean, they, you know, they made something with themselves. But, uh, of course, they had help. But, um, you know, for the most part, middle-class Cubans are hard workers, okay? But, you know, how can you live in a country for, 50 years and you never bother to learn the language. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it just kind of shows a lack of respect, but that's, I, dry, I digress. I grew up in Miami in the 60s and 70s, so what can I tell you? All right, but the point I was trying to make is um, the mighty rushing wind was the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. They were on fire, the cloven tongues, right? And then they were able to speak in the other tongues, the other languages of the people. So, and, you know, Galilee was not an educational center. So this was indeed a supernatural event. So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse, well, let's start in verse 8. Ezekiel 37, 8. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews in the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Say to the wind, 
Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. You know, people, that's what, that's, do you remember the song, Onward Christian Soldiers, Soldiers? That's what we're supposed to be. But um, instead of onward Christian soldiers, the churches have turned it into uh, backward churchy wimps. Backward churchy wimps running from the war. With the star of David blaspheming all the way. Yeah, I know. Don't uh I actually had a decent voice when I was in uh middle school, but uh then the voice changed. What can I tell you? I was actually in choir. But uh yeah, that those days were long time ago. All right. So, an exceeding great army then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out, out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is a foreshadow of the resurrection, people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Do you know that this happened after the resurrection of Christ? Oh yeah, it did. You know, uh, the Jews were... Well, you had the believing Jews, and then you had the unbelieving Jews, and then you had the Canaanites that called themselves, you know what. But unfortunately, you have the children of the devil leading not only the Christians, but they were also doing the same thing to the, the real children of Judah. Because I'm absolutely sure that there is a remnant of true Jews. I'm absolutely positive of that. Uh, I mean, let's face it, there's very few, my opinion, my opinion, true Christians, very few. But let's take a look at this resurrection. Matthew 27, verse 50. Now, this is the crucifixion. Jesus, when he had cried again, and uh, again, with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So, yielded up the ghost. He died in the flesh. In the flesh, okay? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose slept that's a euphemism for they were dead and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many how's that for a testimony you know the uh they crucified christ the veil of the temple rent there was an earthquake the rocks broke the graves were opened and the bodies of the saints came back to life and they wandered their way into jerusalem and appeared unto many and what kind of stories did they tell yeah i was dead but the lord jesus christ he wrote you know i saw him and he he helped me he rose me from the dead and told me to go and tell my brethren and tell everybody what's going on. Now, 
This is not in the Bible, but according to legend, the Pharisees had these people put to death because they didn't want them telling the story of Jesus and upsetting the apple cart, their theological apple cart. Which isn't as far-fetched as uh, people might think. I mean, look at John chapter 12. Uh, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So, uh, let's go back to Ezekiel. Uh, let's see, let's go back to um, verse 12. Ezekiel 37, 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto these, uh, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves." And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came, uh, came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companions, then take another stick and write upon it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. See, there's going to be one flock. You know, remember in Jeremiah 3, 8, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. And then in Jeremiah 31, 31, the Lord promised that he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And remember, I think it's in Hebrews, he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Galatians 3.29, you're, you know, um, uh, in Galatians 3, I think it's 27, 28, or 29, says, you are all one in Christ. You know, these idiots that believe in the pre-trib rapture and they say well you know the church isn't mentioned after revelation chapter 3 you know they, they've got a, a a gentile bride and then they got a jewish bride there's only one bride and when they see the word woman in revelation they don't think oh that's the bride no no, oh, they're up in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lamb while everybody else on earth is getting, uh, getting killed for their faith in Christ. And they're missing the marriage supper of the Lamb. Really? And they think they're, there's a couple of, there's two different brides. I just don't get it. And don't tell me I'm wrong, because I went to Bible college for six years, master's degree, a Baptist Bible college, and the only reason I went was so that I could learn their lies to refute them. Well, that and I got tired of people throwing in my face, oh, well, I've got a, I went to Bible college. You're just a, a stupid layman. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I got tired of hearing that stuff, so guess what? I know what they know, and they know that I know what they know, which is why I have such a low opinion of them. I, I don't think, I, I don't even know if five out of a hundred uh, pastors are even saved. 
Maybe, I don't know. That's not my that's not my job. But I wonder. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. People, the Lord has to bring his children into the land. Not the United Nations, not David Ben-Gurion, not Trump, not Bibi Netanyahu, no, not Golda Meir, no. The United Nations did not create God's Israel. Israel is a people, not a land. And the Lord himself is going to bring the people to the land, not the United Nations in 1948 over in the Middle East. You know, the only reason the evil clergy can get away with all this is because of the laziness and ignorance of churchgoers. And I, I don't even want to call them Christians. Verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. Who's going to be their king? The Lord of lords and king of kings and lord of lords. That's who their king's going to be. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. How? By his blood. That's how. We're going to be washed in his own blood. Revelation 7, 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Tell that to the pre-tribbers. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let's go back to Ezekiel 37. Verse 23. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. How long's forever? Forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. That's going to be a long time. 
Moreover, I love this. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. All right, well, that's the good part. Let's go back to the um, parts where, you know, we got a choice. The world has a choice. We have, as individuals and as a nation, we have a choice. Are we going to follow the Lord as king, or are we going to follow the other guy who's the God of this world temporarily? I imagine the Lord gave Satan some kind of a lease-type agreement. Remember in Job chapter 1, Satan basically threw down the gauntlet, so to speak, laid down a challenge and said, oh yeah, let me take everything away from Job and he'll curse you to his face. And God let him do anything he wanted except for take his life. That was in a previous lesson. I forget which one. But uh, I kind of suspect that's the same thing here. You know, people don't realize that Satan is going to be allowed to test people, especially towards the end times. I mean, they're going to have to really, you know, Jesus said, he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Why would he say that? You know, unless, of course, eternal security is not true. And the Bible clearly shows that we could, our names could be blotted out of the book of life. That's a scary thought, people. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. All right. Remember in a previous study, I was talking about uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Well, the Lord had had a belly full of Ahab and his wife Jezebel. She was a Canaanite, as far as I'm, I know. So what does that make her kids? The same. So then, the Lord had one of his prophets anoint Jehu, who was one of Ahab's uh, captains of one of his armies, you know, he's probably one of the, the highest ranking people in the army. Ahab was killed in battle, from what I, if I'm remembering correctly. So, basically, Jehu was supposed to go and cleanse the land. So, in 2 Kings 9.22, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he, Jehu, answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? So Jezebel is up in the tower, and Jehu shouts up there and says, You know, basically, I'm doing this from memory. He basically says, uh, those are you that are with me. Throw her down. They grabbed Jezebel and they threw her out, out the window. And, of course, she hit the ground and that was it. She was dead. And there was a prophecy that the dogs would uh, lick her blood. I think they ate her, too. Except for, like, maybe the palms of her hands or something like that. I forget the exact thing. You could read about it in 2 Kings chapter 9. Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel 
and her witchcrafts are so many. Second Chronicles 33 and verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. This king of Israel burned his children alive as a sacrifice to the devil. Talk about evil. Also, he observed times. We call that astrology. And used enchantments. Enchantments. Break that word down. Enchantments. And not, and not peppermints or spearmints that you eat. You ever heard of chanting? Uh, chanting is real, how would you say, I guess you could say popular in Eastern religions. You know, they do chants. Well, it's uh, used in witchcraft also. Matter of fact, New Mexico is called the land of enchantment. There's a whole bunch of New Age type places in New Mexico. And no, that's not a, I'm not a hitting anybody that lives there. You know who you are, but you know. So, also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit, an evil spirit. I mean, when you're familiar with a spirit, I mean, you know, it's, that's the opposite of a stranger. You know, a stranger is somebody that you just met. But when you're familiar, you know them. You're familiar with them because you, you've been with them a number of times. A familiar spirit, and he dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Is it any wonder why the Lord sent Assyria and Judah against his people? All right, Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 5. Now, remember, uh, this Assyria was the ones that invaded northern Israel that went into apostasy before Judah even did. Isaiah 10.5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Indignation, extreme hatred. The Assyrian was the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. In other words, the Assyrians were uh, basically what he spanked Israel with. For their wickedness. All right, let's. Uh, I think maybe it's time to go to the New Testament. All right, let's go read First John chapter two. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now in uh, England, they, uh, they call their attorneys or lawyers, they call them advocates or barristers. But an advocate, uh, they're supposed to plead your case. You know, they're on your side. So we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And isn't it wonderful? God the Father, the judge, we have his son for our defense attorney. And, of course, Satan's the prosecutor, right? Verse 2, and he is the propitiation, thank you everybody, 
for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, what were the two commandments that Christ gave us? He said, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these, on these hang all the law and the prophets. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically it in a nutshell. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Nothing about keeping the Sabbath or, you know, we don't have the feast days. You know, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's nothing wrong with keeping Passover. Matter of fact, in the kingdom, we will be keeping tabernacles. But uh, honestly, I don't know how to keep it today because I don't know. I've had people tell me the there's, there's a lunar solar calendar, and I don't know. I don't know. I've, I just, I have no idea. I'm not a Levitical priest. I didn't study that stuff, how to mark the calendar. I just know that in the kingdom, we will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. But right now, I don't even know how to date it properly. And I'm not sure. Some, other, some of you that studied this stuff, you might know, but I'm just not sure. You know, And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody because there's people out there that, no subjects better than I do, and I'm just a kind of a general kind of a guy. I just try to know a little bit about everything. Uh, I don't try to specialize in any one area, maybe in times events, but... So, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar... And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment that ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. And what is that true light? Well, John 8, 12. I tell you almost every Bible study, right? Verse 9, He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Think about it. If we're made in the image of God and you hate your brother, that's why murder was such a thing. Uh, you're killing a creature that was made in God's image. Think about that. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, children, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Boy, they just said that twice, basically, right? Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, 
the love of the Father is not in him. Now, wait a minute. Isn't this a contradiction of John 3.16? Uh, let's take a look. John 3.16, probably the most well-known Bible verse in the entire modern world. For God so loved the world. Wait a minute. We just were told not to love the world. But this says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay. So which is it? Love the world or don't love the world? Well, somebody just recently pointed this out to me, and I thought, wow, that's heavy. It says, for God so loved, past tense. For God so loved the world. God loved his original creation before sin entered into the world, before Adam and Eve fell and there was death in the world. Now, does that make sense? For God so loved, past tense, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, that's why the Lord sent his Son, to redeem us from death unto life. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Uh, have you ever heard of pathology? It's the study of disease. Pathos, the path or the way. Pathology. You know, you, you walk down in the woods in a, during a, in a path. You're following a certain way. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All right, 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, uh, singular, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many, many Antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Just like Judas, right? Judas was with them, but he was not of them. And I'm talking about Iscariot, by the way. Verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that there is no and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Is there a group of people in this world that deny that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah? Yes, there is. 
and their little state was created by the United Nations in 1948 over in the Middle East. Yeah. And church people pray for them and bless them. Really, you're blessing those that are, by Bible definition, antichrists. And then you wonder why the Lord lets them believe in the pre-trib rapture. Oh, maybe that's why. We'll get more on that later. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him." Now, remember, there is a certain group of people that uh, hates Jesus, that are antichrists, and they were responsible for his death. And I'm not talking about the Romans. You want proof? Let's take a look at the book of John, chapter 19. Um... Uh, there are a certain group of people that consider the New Testament the most anti-Semitic book in the world. John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now this is the trial of Jesus, people. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put, put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, now these are not Catholic priests, people. When the chief priests, therefore, an officer saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Pilate wasn't even saved, and he, and he was afraid. He had more sense than those that brought Christ to him to, to have him put to death. Verse 9, And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Jesus, uh, Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. You know, people, no matter what happens in this world, Nothing happens without the Father allowing it to happen. Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. 
You know, there's sin and then there's greater sin. And when people tell you, well, you know, all sin's the same with God, I don't know. Jesus says that there's sin and then there's greater sin. So, I don't know. And then there's abominations. And abominations are so bad that God said to put those people to death. Uh, the churches don't teach that anymore. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Verse 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Who was responsible for putting Christ to death? Not Rome, not Pilate. Take a guess. Let's skip down to verse 15. Verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Boy, you guys sure could have fooled me in 70 AD when you revolted against Rome and uh, the Roman legions came and destroyed Jerusalem, totally destroying the temple, throwing every stone down upon another. Sorry, Charlie, but the, the Wailing Wall is not the temple. You're wrong. You're lying. Now, who put Jesus to death? Not Rome, not Pilate. Okay, there was a group of people who are, by Bible definition, antichrists. We just read about them. And guess what? They're proud of having put their ancestors having put Christ to death. Let's read the parallel account, Matthew 27, real quick. Verse 23. And the governor, well, Pilate, right? And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So basically, the Antichrist crucified Jesus. But guess what? Second Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 1. Now, Jehoshaphat was a good king. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, which is an, an Old Testament name for prophet, and uh, that's not the same Jehu that was anointed king. This is a different one. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? Should you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Good question. Should we help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Should the church world be blessing the Antichrist that hate Jesus? Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Wow. 
Haven't you always been taught in church? Well, God said, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curse thee. But God, they, the Lord was talking about Abraham. And wasn't Christ of Abraham? Absolutely. But yet, this group of people, they cursed Jesus. Who was of Abraham? So maybe they're cursed. What do you think? Oh, here we go. Here's another one of thing of Paul. Why they hate Paul. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. You know what anathema means? Cursed. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, cursed, maranatha. Huh. Do the you-know-whos love the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, no. They're cursed. Why are we blessing, as a church world, people that are cursed, antichrist, that hate the Lord Jesus? And they think that, you know, there's no way that the Lord would let them go through the tribulation. But God's wrath is upon them for blessing those that hate his children. I mean, hate his only begotten son. Now remember, people, if I get booted off YouTube, I'm going to be on BitChute. That'll probably be the last place. Um, and I don't think BitChute's going to be around that long. Uh, the enemies, their enemies are loading uh, copyrighted material on there, like movies and stuff because they're based in England and uh, I'm sure that they're going to be destroyed too and when that happens well uh, there's people that teach the same kind of stuff I do in like England and Canada and they're going to prison yeah for anti uh, for hate crimes yeah anti you know what now, there are people who will tell you that the Lord would never lie or deceive people. I'm not saying the Lord's a liar, but listen carefully to this. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 20. I mean, I try to teach you stuff that the churches won't touch. Now, remember, Ahab was bad to the bone. Uh, what was that song, Bad to the Bone, the Terminator... Uh, yeah, uh, the Terminator movie when Arnie went into the bar. Um, George Thorogood, yeah, I remember that song. Verse 20, and the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? Now remember, Ahab was bad news bears. Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Fall down dead people. That's what they're saying here. And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit. And I don't believe this is an evil, I don't believe this is one of devil, uh, Satan's spirits. I don't think so. I think this is one of God's spirits. But uh, don't quote me on that. That's just my opinion. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. So here it is. This spirit is going to persuade Ahab to go to Ramoth Gilead where he's going to fall in battle down dead. Verse 22, And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. His prophets. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he, the Lord, said, And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and shall and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now here's the prophet speaking to 
Ahab. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Wow. Do you know that the Lord will put a lying spirit in the mouth of the false prophets to persuade the evil people to go to their doom? That is heavy. Woo. You want to know why these people that bless the Antichrist, that hate the Lord, why they believe in the pre-trib rapture? How about Ezekiel 14.9? This is the Lord speaking now. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Boy, that is some harsh, harsh language. Now, we're going to read this in the next study. I guess I'm going to have to have another study because I'm not even close to being done. I know, I'm long-winded. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, not Satan, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God's going to send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might be damned because they wanted to have pleasure in unrighteousness. What's a delusion? That's where you believe something to be true when it absolutely is not true. That's a delusion. You know, uh, there's people on this earth that said, oh, I'm Jesus. And they, you know, supposedly they absolutely believe that, but they, I Sorry, you know, that job's already been taken. Um, you know, people thought that they were Napoleon. Well, Napoleon died over a hundred and something years ago. Um, you know, so believing something that's not true is a delusion. And God sends them this delusion. You know, when you want your wickedness, God will deceive you. That's scary, people. Let me tell you what, that's scary. When you believe that you're truly saved and you're doing the works of the Lord, but God's deceiving you because of the things you do. Now, I'm humbled when I think about that. Really. Really. Boy, that is, that's, oof, that's rough. All right, well, let's, uh, let's end this Bible study, and uh, we are going to hit the New Testament. Um, peace and safety. You can have the peace and safety of the Lord, or the false peace and safety of the other guy. And we're going to cover that. We're going to cover the end time events. I think I should be able to finish the next, uh, another hour of study. And uh, should be able to close it out. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him and Him alone. In Jesus' name. Amen.